Hello, everybody. This is Miss Rachel and Miss Heather from the Hangerstown Public Library, and we are back for the virtual mythology class. Uh, we have a little craft to do today. So, um, for those of you who picked up the supplies on our front porch, you could do that, and the other of you, I guess, can just listen. But we've got um, some crafts, and we're going to do a little bit of review on the gods, and then we've got some stories for you. And then at the end of the program, I will, or Heather, one of us, will. Uh, we have a code word for you guys that, so you can get um, points for listening to this. So Heather is going to start with um, some stuff, and I actually need to go get the code word because I forgot to do yeah. that before this. So Heather's going to start, and I'll be right back. Okay. Hey guys, um, this is Miss Heather. Like she said, um, I am going to review what a little bit of what we learned last week. So I'll have like pictures of the gods we showed you, and then just a quick snippet of what they are and what they represent. Okay, let's do this. So Zeus, remember Zeus? He was the main man, the head honcho of them all. He was the most powerful. He was the god of the sky and the king of Olympus. See. His symbol was a thunderbolt. Okay. Next was his wife Hera. She was the goddess of marriage and let's see, the queen of Olympus. So she was Zeus's wife. So that's the husband. That was his wife. Okay. Next we have let's see, Poseidon. He was the god of the sea and the oceans. His symbol was the trident. <clears throat> Think of. What was Ariel's dad's name? King Triton. Yeah. That's kind of like, and like King the Triton. the Little Mermaid. And the Little Mermaid. So then he was the ruler of the seas and the oceans. Then we have Hades and Sybaris, his little guard dog. Um, he was the guardian of the underworld, kind of like he ruled the world underground, basically, and took care of the souls and dead people. Um, next we have... Let's on her... We have Aphrodite next, if I can find her. <laughs> Of course, she's the first one. one. <laughs> so this is Aphrodite. She is, let's see, the goddess of love and beauty. So if you think about Valentine's Day, she's a big part of that. Um, let's see, she's the protector of all the sailors. So everybody that sails around the world, they would pray to her to keep her safe, keep them safe and for good fishing with Poseidon. Um, let's see. Next, we have Apollo. He was the god of music and healing. So anything music or even like medical wise, that's what they prayed for and prayed to. Um, and he hunted with a silver bow. Let's see. Next we have Ares. This guy right here. He was, he was the god of war. So whenever you wanted to go to war or wanted, you know, war that's who you pray to usually he's seen with a spear that's covered in blood but apparently that day he felt like cleaning it <laughs> um he was very cruel and he was a coward um there are different meanings to coward there's you know the ones that kind of scare you away but this guy he was a different kind of coward he would do something and they'd be like oh no i didn't do that <laughs> um and he was the son of zeus next we have artemis this was the goddess of the hunt and protector of women and childbirth. Um, her sign was the deer, and then she was always seen with her bow. Um, the next one we have is Hephaestus. He was like the god of blacksmithing. He would make the weapons and everything for the gods when they went to war and battle. Um, his symbol was the forge and the anvil. Um, See the next one we have should be Athena. On the other side. Athena. Yeah, we have Athena. She was the god of wisdom and she was really good at being strategic and planning war plans. Um, her symbol was the owl, and then she always had a spear and a big helmet. She was really smart. Um, next, Hestius. We have where is Hestia? Where is she? There, there she is. is. Yeah. So we have Hestia. And she is usually seen with fire in her hand. Um, Hestia was the goddess of the hearth. Um, so the fireplace is the center of the home. So the hearth is what you would, like modern day, you would lay things on, like candles or decorations and stuff like that. 
Um, she was the gentlest of God and did not play a role in many myths. So she was kind of like a placeholder, but she was important in the home. Um, the next we have is Hermes. So whenever you see Hermes, he has wings on his shoes and on his hat. So that's how he flies, kind of like a mailman and a messenger for the gods. Um, let's see. Next we have Demeter. She was the goddess of the harvest. So it's very important for the farmers to have prayed to her for a good crop and good production of the crop. Um, let's see. Um, the next one is Dionysus. He's kind of the king of party. His symbol were the ivy and um, wine and grape. Um, he was just a really fun god. Um, so that's kind of like a quick review on our gods for today, okay? So today, I know a few of you have picked up your craft packets, and you should have had this in there, How we're, what we're going to do. Basic, it's real, real simple, real easy um, of how we're going to do it. And then I just have... A black sharpie because I like the very old looking um, ancient Greek pottery it was either in reds or blacks or you know very simple colors so what I'm gonna do I'm just gonna do a quick design on my terracotta pot you guys have a little bit smaller but um, this is you know to show um, a little bit more detail so I will have Miss Rachel read you about um, Medusa or mm -hmm. the um, arachnia do you wreck me in? Um, sure. Okay, so I'm gonna do that and then I'll show you my design when we get a minute, okay? Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna read the story of Arachne. Um, she is, well, I'll read you the story. We'll just go from <laughs> there. <laughs> okay, there was a young girl in Greece whose name was Arachne. Her face was pale but fair and her hair was long and dark. All that she cared to do from morn till noon was to sit in the sun and spin. And all that she cared to do from noon till night was to sit in the shade and weave. And oh, how fine and fair were the things that she wove on her loom. Flax, wool, silk, she worked with them all. And when they came from her hands, the cloth which she had made them from was so thin and soft and bright that people came from all parts of the world to see it. And they said that cloth so rare could not be made of wool, flax, or silk, but the warp, but that the warp was of rays of sunlight and the That, doesn't, that sentence doesn't make sense. But that the warp was of rays of sunlight and the woof was of threads of gold. I don't know what that means. I think they meant wool was of threads of gold. Um, and then as day by day the girl sat in the sun and spun or sat in the shade and wove, she said, In all the world there is no yarn so fine as mine. In all the world there is no cloth so soft and smooth nor silk so bright and rare. One afternoon as she sat in the shade weaving and talking with passers-by, Someone asked of her, Who taught you to spin and weave so well? No one taught me, Arachne replied. I learned how to do it as I sat in the sun in the shade, but no one showed me. But it may be that Athena, goddess of wisdom, taught you, and you did not know it. Athena? Bah, said Arachne. How could she teach me? Can she spin such skeins of yarn of these? Can she weave goods like mine? I should like to see her try. I can likely teach her a thing or two. She looked up and saw in the doorway a tall woman wrapped in a long cloak. Her face was fair to see, but stern, oh so stern, and her gray eyes were so sharp and bright that Arachne could not meet her gaze. Arachne said the woman, I am Athena, the goddess of craft and wisdom, and I have heard your boast. Are you certain you still mean to say that you can spin and weave as well as I? Arach er, Arachne's cheeks paled, but she said, yes, I can weave as well as you. Then let me tell you what you will do, said Athena. Three days from now we will both weave, you on your loom and I on mine. We will ask all who wish to come and see us, and great Zeus, who sits in the clouds, shall be the judge. And if your work is best, then I will weave no more so long as the world shall shine, but er, no more as long as the world shall last. But if my work is best, then you shall never use loom or spindle. Do you agree to this? I agree, said Arachne. Very well, said Athena, and she was gone. When it came time for the contest in weaving, hundreds were there to see it, and great Zeus sat among the clouds and looked on. Arachne took her skeins of finest silk and began to weave, and she wove a web of marvelous beauty, so thin and light that it could float in the air, and yet so strong that it could hold a lion in its meshes. 
and the threads of warp and woof were of many colors so beautifully arranged and mingled one and and mingled one that another that all saw were filled with delight. No wonder that the maiden boasted of her skill, said the people, and Zeus himself nodded. Then Athena began to weave, and she took of the sunbeams that gilded the mountain top, and of the snowy fleece of the summer clouds, and of the blue ether of the summer sky, and of the bright green of the summer fields, and of the royal purple of the autumn woods. And what do you suppose she wove? The web she wove was full of enchanting pictures of flowers and gardens, and of towers and castles, of mountain heights, and of men and beasts, and of giants and dwarfs, and of the mighty beings who dwelt on the clouds with Zeus. And those who looked upon it were so filled with wonder and delight that they forgot all about the beautiful web which Arachne had woven. And Arachne herself was ashamed and afraid when she saw it, and she hid her face in her hands and wept. Oh, how can I live, she cried, now that I must never again use loom or spindle. And she kept on weeping and saying, How can I live? Then, when Athena saw that the poor maiden would never have any joy unless she were allowed to spin and weave, she took pity on her and said, I would, you, I would free you from your bargain if I could, but that is a thing which no one can do. You must hold to your agreement never to touch loom or spindle again. And yet, since you will never be happy unless you can spin and weave, I will give you a new form so that you can carry on your work with neither spindle nor loom. Then she touched Arachne with the tip of her spear, which she sometimes carried, and the maiden was changed at once into a nimble spider, which ran into a shady place in the grass and began merrily to spin and weave a beautiful web. I have heard it said that all spiders which have been in the world since then are children of Arachne. Perhaps Arachne still lives and spins and weaves, and the very next spider which you see may be her herself. Now, there is another part of the story that I've heard before, and basically... It starts out the same where Athena and Arachne have a contest, but then Athena was so angry with Arachne that she cursed her into becoming a spider. So um, there are different sides of stories. A lot of these Greek stories have like different little twists. Um, so sometimes they're a little inconsistent, but that's the story of Arachne. So um, yeah, I think even if I love to spin and weave that much, I would not want to become a spider, but Guess everybody has the things, right? <laughs> okay, so Miss Mary Avery said warp and woof are weaving terms, she thinks. Oh, okay. So that's something I learned today. I did not know that because I thought it must have been a typo or something. That's pretty neat. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So I am done with my pot. So I kind of just did a simple design on the top or on the rim. And it just goes around that way. And then I did, so my last name is Beach. And so, like, always think about water and stuff like that when it comes to... So, I did the sign of Poseidon with this triton and, like, a shield form. And then the other side, um, my family and I like to hunt. So, I did deer antlers for... Um, oh? Artemis. Artemis. So, that's something that was kind of, like, important to me. And that's what deer feed our families. So, and then beach is Poseidon for my last name. So, that was something that kind of... I felt like doing. You can do anything you want. Um, some of the examples I put on there is like um, they would create pottery for like everyday life. So you could like have a bowl for bread, for your rice, for whatever. Um, and they would design it for like stories of your life um, and tribute to the gods, goddesses, um, stuff like that. Or it's just, you know, for everyday food wear. So that's just something you can create. You can even, you know, with them being pots, you can even put flowers in them. Whatever you feel like doing, just add a little bit of Greek flair to it. <laughs> And if you guys would like to, when you're done with your pots, feel free to share them in the comments below so we can see what you've done with them. Yeah, that'd be really cool to see um, because I know you guys are really creative, so I'm going to see what you've done. Okay, so um, do you want to read a story? Absolutely. Okay. So she's going to read the story of Medusa, which is basically how Medusa became Medusa. So. so a little background on Medusa, like everybody's seen and knows what she looks like. She's a gorgon, she's green, she's scaly, she kind of looks like a snake. And she has snakes for hair, right? We've all seen that in different forms. We've seen it in Monsters, Inc. She's kind of like, there's kind of like a character like Medusa. We've seen it in Disney Her Hercules and a couple other different forms. So I'm going to read you the actual story of her, okay? So once upon a time, a long time ago, there lived a beautiful maiden named Medusa. Medusa lived in a city of Athens in a country named Greece. And although there were many pretty girls in the city, Medusa was considered the most lovely. 
Unfortunately, Medusa was very proud of her beauty and thought or and thought or spoke of little else. Each day she boasted how pretty she was, and each day her boast became more and more outrageous. On Sunday, Medusa bragged to the miller that her skin was more beautiful than fresh fallen snow. On Monday, she told the cobbler her hair glowed brighter than the sun. On Tuesday, she commented on the blacksmith's son, commented to the blacksmith's son that her eyes were greener than a GNC. On Wednesday, she boasted to everyone the public gardens in the public gardens that the lips are redder than the reddest rose. When she wasn't busy sharing her thoughts about her beauty with all who passed by, Medusa would glaze lovingly at reflection in a mirror. So imagine you've got a mirror up here and you're just like gazing and looking and how pretty you are, how handsome you are, and it's something that's constantly going on and you're constantly talking about yourself and your beauty and how handsome or how beautiful you are. Okay, so on and on Medusa went about her beauty to anyone and everyone who stopped long enough to hear her until one day when she made her first visit to the Parthenon with her friends. The Parthenon was the largest temple to the goddess Athena in all the land. It was decorated with amazing sculptures and paintings. Everyone who entered was awed by the beauty of the place and couldn't help but think of how grateful they were to Athena, goddess of wisdom, for inspiring them for watching over their city of Athens. So Athens was named for Athena. There, it's kind of like their goddess they celebrated and loved. Um, everyone that is except Medusa. <laughs> when Medusa saw the sculpture, she whispered that she would have made much better sculptor subject for the sculpture than Athena had. When Medusa saw the artwork, she commented that the artist had done a fine job considering the goddess's thick eyebrows. But imagine how much more wonderful the painting would be if that was someone as delicate as Medusa. So one of the things we learned last week was that eyebrows were important for women. The thicker, and if you had a unibrow, that was popular, and that was the thing to have as a woman. Okay, let's see. And when Medusa reached the altar, she sighed happily and said, My, this is a beautiful temple. It is a shame it was wasted on Athena, for I am so much prettier than she is. Perhaps someday people will build an even grander temple to my beauty. That's where she messed up. So Medusa's friends grew pale. The priestesses who overheard Medusa gasped. Whispers ran through all the people in the temple who quickly began to leave, for everyone knew that Athena enjoyed watching over the people of Athens and feared what might happen if the goddess had overheard Medusa's rash remarks. Before long, the temple was empty of everyone except Medusa, who was so busy gazing profoundly at a reflection in the large bronze door that she hadn't noticed the swift, swift departure of everyone else. The image she was gazing at wavered, and suddenly, instead of her own feature, features, it was a fa the face of Athena that Medusa saw reflected back at her. Vain and foolish girl, Athena said angrily, you think you're prettier than I? I doubt it to be true, but even if it were, there is more to life than beauty alone. While others work and play and learn, you do a little bit boast and admire yourself. <clears throat> Medusa tried to point out that her beauty was inspiration for those around and that she made their lives better by simply looking so lovely. But Athena silenced her with a frustrated wave. Get out of here. Nope. Nope. And with those words, Medusa's face changed to that of every hideous monster. Her hair twisted and thickened into horrible snakes that hissed and fought each other at top of her head. So when I was telling you about the snakes in her head, it was like this, and they constantly battled and hissed at each other. Medusa, for your pride, this has been done. Your face is now so terrible to behold that the mere sight of it will turn you men into stone, proclaimed the goddess. Even you, Medusa, should seek your reflection shall turn into rock the instant you see your face. And with that, Athena sent Medusa with her hair of snakes to live in the blind, live with the blind monsters, the Gorgon sisters, at the ends of the earth, so that no innocence would be accidentally turned to stone at the sight of her. So I think we learned from those two stories we've listened to to not insult Athena. Um, pretty much any of the gods, but these two stories have been about Athena so far. But yeah, when people insulted the gods, they either did not live very long or they had something bad happen to them. And I personally think it'd be hard to sleep with snakes on your head. So Yeah, especially if they're like constantly fighting. I mean. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So um, let's see. Next, I'm going to read uh, the story about the Minotaur and the Labyrinth of Crete. And then, um, yeah, we'll just start there and see where we go depending on what kind of time we have. So the Minotaur was the son of Pasiphae, wife of King Minos of Crete. 
Queen Pasiphae slept with a bull sent by Zeus and gave birth to a minotaur, a creature half man and half bull. King Minos was embarrassed, but did not want to kill the minotaur, so he hid the monster in the labyrinth constructed by Daedalus, the Minoan, Minoan? Mm-hmm. Minoan palace of Gnosis. According to the myth, Minos was imprisoning his enemies in the labyrinth so that the minotaur could eat them. The labyrinth was such a complicated construction that no one could ever find the way out alive. Son of Minos, Androgeus went to Athens to participate in the Panathenic Games, but he was killed during the marathon by the bull which impregnated his mother, Pasiphae. Minos was infuriated and demanded Agius, the king of Athens, to send seven men and women every year to the Minotaur to advert the plague caused by the death of Androgeus. The third year, Theseus, son of Agius, decided to be one of the seven young men that would go to Crete in order to kill the Minotaur and end the human sacrifices to the monster. King Agius tried to make him change his mind, but Theseus was determined to slay the Minotaur. Theseus promised his father that he would put up white sails coming back from Crete, allowing him to know in advance that he was coming back alive. The boat would return with black sails if Theseus was killed. Theseus announced to King Minos that he was going to kill the Minotaur, but Minos knew that even if he did manage to kill the Minotaur, Theseus would never be able to exit the labyrinth. Theseus met Princess Ariadne, daughter of King Minos, who fell madly in love with him and decided to help Theseus. She gave him a thread and told him to unravel it as he would penetrate deeper and deeper into the labyrinth so that he knows the way out when he kills the monster. Theseus followed her suggestion suggestion and entered the labyrinth with the thread. Theseus managed to kill the Minotaur and save the Athenians, and with Ariadne's thread, he managed to retrace his way out. Theseus, Theseus took Princess Ariadne with him and left Crete, sailing happily back to Athens. Theseus' boat stopped at Naxos, and the Athenians had a long celebration dedicated to Theseus and and Ariadne. After long hours of feasting and drinking, Ariadne fell asleep on the shore and didn't enter the boat that sailed to Athens. Theseus figured out that Ariadne was not with them when it was too late, and he was so upset that he forgot the promise made to his father and did not change the sails. A different version of the myth mentions that Theseus deliberately left Ariadne on Naxos. King Agius wait, it, waiting at Cape Sunion went to see the sails of the boat. He saw black sails from afar and presumed his son was dead. He dropped himself to the waters, committing suicide, and since then, this sea is called the Aegean Sea. Now, I wanted to go back to the note. Um, I The version I'm most familiar with in this story was that Princess Ariadne was a little... A little clingy. I um, She really liked Theseus, and Theseus didn't really like her, but he accepted her help because he didn't want to die and he wanted to get out of the labyrinth. So she made him promise that he would take her with him, and but he didn't really want to. But when they stopped at the island overnight to camp out and whatever, um, they got up the next morning and left her there on purpose. And she was so mad, as I would be, And Apollo came and rescued her, and he cursed everyone on the ship to forget to switch the sails. So um, the version I have is that they forgot about the sails, and the king died. But then um, Theseus came back, and he became king. So there are different versions of almost every single one of these stories. But All right. And it usually involves a tale to take out of it and something like cautionary tale to heed and there's something underlying within those stories and usually the gods have something planned or plotted and something like that Mm -hmm. so i am going to read to you icarus we're going to talk about icarus um i know in some schools you discuss it at um certain grade levels i remember discussing it like fifth grade sixth grade Um, So this is what I've, this is the story of Icarus, okay? So on the island of Crete, during the age of King Minos, there lived a man named Dadius and his son, his young son, Icarus. Dadius was just an ordinary man, except for one special talent. He was an inventor of strange and wonderful mechanical creations. 
Now, this was a very long time ago, and in this ancient time, there were no televisions, cars, or clocks. Instead of TV, people learned what new, what was new in the land by listening to the gossip of the local inn. Instead of cars, people get place to place walking, or if they were wealthy, by riding on a horse in a carriage. Instead of clocks, people kept track of the time using sundials. Also, and so, the tiny mechanical bird that chirped when the sun rose, given by Daedalus to the newborn princess to celebrate her birth, became the talk of everyone in the land. King Minos approached Daedalus to ask if he'd be able to invent something less pretty but more useful, and Daedalus did not disappoint. A few months later, he presented the plans for a giant labyrinth to hold the half-man, half-bull monster, known as the Minotaur prisoner. So this goes back with what Miss Rachel just read. It kind of ties in. So, King Minus was very pleased. Unfortunately, King Minus was also very greedy. He wanted Daedalus to work only for him, and so he had his royal guards take Daedalus and his young son, Icarus, and lock them away in a cave high above the sea. The only entrances to the cave were through the labyrinth, guarded by the king's soldiers, not to mention the Minotaur, and an entrance overlooking the sea high up on the cliff, a uh, side of a cliff. Excuse me. Daedalus didn't mind his imprisonment at first. Whatever Daedalus needed, King Minus provided without question. Food, drink, tools of all shapes, rare metals, leather, parchment, and even candles so he could work late into the night. Daedalus lived happily for many years working away on the endless variety of wondrous inventions. And young Icarus, although sometimes bored, was usually quite happy helping out his father and playing with the mechanical toys Daedalus made for him. It wasn't until Icarus became a teenager that Daedalus began to wonder if being locked away wasn't the best thing for his son. And Icarus tried, tired of the cold, damp... <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and Icarus, tired of the cold, damp cave, began to complain that he had no hope of a life of his own. On his 16th birthday, Icarus broke into a rage. But father, I want an adventure, maybe even to meet a girl and have a son of my own. I can't very well ask a wife to come live with me in this lonely cave over the sea. I hate this cave. I hate the king. And I hate you. That's a teenager for you. Of course, Icarus apologized later for saying such mean things to his father. But instead, he couldn't stand being cooped up in the cave any longer. The next time King Minus visited, Daedalus approached him nervously. Your majesty, surely you must see as Icarus is becoming a young man. You can't plan to keep him locked away for his entire life. Please, sire, let me join your royal guard and seek a life in your service. The king raised an eyebrow and, and stared thoughtfully out, out the opening of the cave. I shall reconsider your request. Now, if you please, show me again your idea for the giant mechanical men. The king didn't really have to think too long about it. He knew right away he didn't want to let either Daedalus or Icarus go. <sighs> Who can know whether Icarus would have his father's talents? After all... Icarus had watched and learned from his father for his entire life. Under no circumstance did he want another kingdom to get their hands on mechanical wonders Daedalus created and Icarus might someday produce. Weeks later, King Minos returned to Daedalus with the answer. Icarus provides the greatest service to our realm by keeping your company here. But sire, began Daedalus, enough, roared King Minos. The decision has been made. I will have no arguments. Daedalus turned to Icarus to explain that there was nothing to be done, but he saw the look of utter despair in his son's face. Daedalus' heart broke and vowed that he would do anything in his power to keep his boy happy again. But what to do? Daedalus stood, staring out of the entrance of the cave, overlooking the sea, watching the waves crash on the rocks below and the seagulls fly over the cliffs. It was spring, and the nests on the cliffs were filled with eggs and chicks. Icarus walked up beside his father and said softly, how I envy those baby birds, for soon their wings will be so strong they'll be able to fly away from the wretched cliff. Daedalus blinked, a smile slowly growing in his face. He turned to Icarus, his eyes twinkling. Well then, my little fledgling, we better, we'd best start working on strengthening your wings so you can fly like the others. First, Daedalus used strips of leather and fine twigs to fashion a broom and a large net which he had Icarus dangled down towards the cliffs to sweep up the feathers near the seagull nests. For many days, Icarus caught, carefully gathered every feather he could reach. While Icarus was busy with the feathers, Daedalus created the thin tubes of light metal with he used to perform the frame of two pairs of man-sized wings. 
He used leather strips to create a harness and pulleys to allow the wearer to flap and tilt the wings in various directions. Then he took the feathers that Icarus had collected and used candle wax to begin to attach the feathers in light metal frames. Two frames? Icarus smiled happily at his father. Are you coming too? Daedalus clapped his son on the shoulder and replied, I am my son. Thank you for reminding me of all my creations. You were the most important to me. I'm sorry that it's taken me so long for, to free us both. It was painstaking work collecting the feathers and attaching them one by one to the frames, but a few weeks later, as the first fledgling seagulls began to leave their nests, Daedalus declared the wings complete. The day they were to leave, Daedalus lectured Icarus one last time. Now, son, remember, you must be cautious when we fly. Fly too close to the oceans, your wings will become heavy with water and spray off the waves. Fly too close to the sun and the wax will melt and you'll lose your feathers. Follow my path closely and you'll be fine. Icarus nodded excitedly, slid his arms into the harness. He listened absently as his father explained how to open the wings wide to catch the air currents and how to use the pulleys to steer. With an eager hug, good luck, Daedalus and Icarus stepped into the entrance of the cave overlooking the sea, spread their wings as wide as they could go, and leaped one after the other out over the ocean. As if been waiting for him, the wind caught Icarus' wings almost immediately, and up he soared. Oh, what freedom! Icarus threw his head back and laughed, and startled seagulls dodged away from him and then swooped back squawking warnings when he steered too close to the nesting cliffs. Daedalus shouted to his son to be careful, stop playing with the birds, and follow him toward the shore of an island in the distance. But Icarus was having too much fun. He was tired of always following his father, always listening to his endless lectures, and Icarus was thrilled with such freedom. He watched the seagulls rise in the air currents up over the sea and thought, oh, to himself, careful. Bah, the birds aren't careful. They're happy. They're free. Oh, what a glorious adventure this is. The sun is so warm and the breeze tugs at my wings as if even the wind is happy. I'm finally loose. I can't believe I've been missing this for all these years trapped in that cool, damp cave. And he, and with that, he followed the seagulls up and up and up into the sky. What do you think happened? Let's see. No, Icarus, stop, shouted Daedalus. The wax will if it gets too warm. Not so high, not so high. But Icarus was too far away or too lost in his own happy thoughts of excitement to listen to his father's warnings. As he flew still higher, he began to feel warm wax stripping down his arms and saw feathers falling like snowflakes down around him. Remembering his father's lectures, Icarus realized the horror of his mistake. He began to work the pulleys to tilt his wing back down toward the sea, but as he did so, he saw more feathers drifting away, and he began to lose height more quickly than he wanted. Working the pulleys even more frantically, Icarus flapped the wings, trying to slow his fall, but the harder he flopped, the more feathers detached from the frame of his wing. As Daedalus watched in horror, Icarus plunged toward the sea frantically, flapping the pulleys with his arms. When he finally hit the water, there wasn't a feather left attached. Daedalus landed as quickly as he could in the beach, near where Icarus had fallen, but the only sign of his poor child were a few feathers floating in the waves. Daedalus crumpled to the sand, his father, his face, and his hands for he knew his son was dead. After many months, when Daedalus began to recover from his grief, he named the island Icaria in memory of his son. On the beach where he landed, he built a temple to the sun god Apollo, and inside he hung the wings he created, vowing to never fly again. Hmm. I think it would be really cool to learn how to fly like that, but I think I'd probably want something other than wax, and not to do it over an ocean. Yeah, maybe a giant trampoline or something. Trampoline would be good. I would trust duct tape all the way. Yeah. It fixes everything. They probably didn't have duct tape or trampolines back then, though. But We do now. <laughs> but don't do that. Yeah. Please do not do yeah. that. Please, no. Yes, so that would not be good. Okay, um, okay so I've got another story here. Um, and let's see. So it's the story of Perseus versus Medusa which we already talked about Medusa earlier, how she was created, um, like how she was uh, the girl, and then Athena cursed her to have snakes on her head. So um, this is, I think it's pretty much the most popular story of Medusa. Mm. Um, there aren't a ton of them, but there are a couple. Okay, so here we go. Perseus was one of the most famous of the legendary heroes of ancient times. He was the son of Zeus and 
Danae, daughter of Acreus, king of Argos. An oracle foretold to Acreus that a son of Danae would be the cause of his death. So he imprisoned her in a tall tower in order to keep her isolated from the world. Zeus, however, descended through the roof of the tower in the form of a shower of gold, and the lovely Danae became his bride. For four years, Acreus had no idea this happened, but one evening, as he happened to walk by Danae's room, he heard the cry of a young child from, from within, which led to the discovery of his daughter's marriage with Zeus. Enraged, Acreus commanded the mother and child to be placed in a chest and thrown into the sea. But it was not the will of Zeus that they should die. The chest floated safely to the island of Seraphis, where Dictes, brother of Polydectes, king of the island, was fishing on the seashore, and he saw the chest abandoned on the beach. Pitying the helpless condition of its unhappy occupants, he led them to the palace of the king. Polydectes knew he wanted Danae as his wife the instant he laid eyes on her. Yet for many years, Danae and Perseus remained on the island, which, or where, unbeknownst to Polydectes, Perseus received an educational or education suitable for a hero from the best teacher available, Achilles, Hercules, Jason's, and Theseus's teacher, Chiron the Centaur. I think it'd be pretty cool to be taught by a centaur. Yeah. I'd want to just meet a centaur. I think that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> Too bad they're not real, right? <laughs> I would, but it'd be kind of scary at the same time. Yeah, in a lot of stories, centaurs are kind of moody. They can be get kind of grouchy. They have attitudes. Yes. <laughs> As he grew up, Perseus believed Polydectes was less than honorable and protected his mother from him. Then, Polydectes plotted to send Perseus away on a long, impossible task to humiliate him, or even better, kill him so that he would stop interfering with his plan to marry Danae. He held a large banquet where each guest was expected to bring a gift, but Perseus was unaware of this custom, so he asked Polydectes to name the gift. He, could, he would not refuse it. Polydectes held Perseus to his reckless promise and demanded the head of the only mortal Gorgon, Medusa, whose gaze turned people to stone. So, as it said, if uh, Perseus looked at Medusa, it would turn him to stone, which he would die. So, that's kind of a ridiculous mission. To accomplish this, Athena advised him to find the Hesperide nymphs, who only the Grey knew where they lived. Perseus started on his expedition and guided by Hermes and Athena arrived after a long journey in the far off region on the borders of Oceanus where the gray lived. He at once asked them for the necessary information and on their refusal to grant it, he stole their single eye and tooth, which he only gave back to them when they gave him full directions with regard to his route. He then proceeded to the land of the Hesperides from which he, he may obtain the objects crucial to his promise. Now, the Grey um, and many stories were three old women who lived together in a shack out in the middle of nowhere in the woods. Uh, they're basically like witches, but between them, between the three of them, there was one eyeball and one tooth. So they shared it, which is kind of gross. But, um, yeah, so they that was like their most prized possessions because if none of them could see, then that was a problem. So um, he stole the eyeball, and in one story, he threatened to squish it if they didn't tell him where um, they needed to go, or where he needed to go. So that's one way to get it done, I guess. To accomplish this, if, oh wait, we already read that paragraph. From the Hesperides, he received a bag to safely contain Medusa's head. Zeus gave him an adamantine sword and Hades' helm of darkness to make him invisible. Hermes lent Perseus winged sandals to fly, and Athena gave him a polished shield. Perseus then proceeded to the Gorgon's cave. Equipped with the magic items, he attached to his feet the winged sandals and flew to the land of the Gorgons, whom he found fast asleep in a cave. Now, as Perseus had been warned by his heavenly guides that whoever looked upon these weird sisters would be transformed into stone, he stood with his face away from the sleepers and looked at them through the reflection in his bright metal shield. Then, guided by Athena, he cut off the head of Medusa, which he placed in his bag. As soon as he had done that, from Medusa's headless body, there sprang forth the winged horse Pegasus, who flew up into the sky. He now hurried to escape the pursuit of the two surviving sisters, who, awoken from their sleep, eagerly rushed to avenge the death of their sister. So we read about the story of Medusa, or of Pegasus, last week. Um... 
And most stories say that he was born from Medusa. Um, and another story of Medusa that I've read, there was this, um, there was a fight between Perseus and Medusa, and she kept trying to kill him, and he trying to kill her, but um, he had to look in the reflection of his shield. So he had a shield, and because he couldn't look directly at her, he had to uh, look in the reflection to see where she was so he could swing the sword, because otherwise he was basically fighting blind. His invisible helmet and winged sandals here came in handy, for the former concealed him from the view of the Gorgons, while the latter carried him swiftly over land and sea, far beyond the pursuit of, far beyond the reach of pursuit. In passing over the burning plans of Libya, the drops of blood from the head of Medusa oozed from the bag, and falling on the hot sands below produced many colored snakes which spread all over the country. Perseus continued his flight until he reached the kingdom of Atlas, of whom he begged rest and shelter. But as Atlas protected the garden of the Hesperides, where every tree produced golden fruit, he was afraid that this hero, who had just killed the monstrous Medusa, might also destroy the dragon, which guarded it, and then steal his treasures. He therefore refused to grant the hospitality that the hero demanded. So Perseus, irritated at Atlas' refusal, reached into the bag and pulled off the head of Medusa, and holding it towards the king, transformed him into a stony mountain. Beard and hair erected themselves into forests, shoulders and hands and limbs became huge rocks, and the head grew into a rocky peak which reached into the clouds. So if you remember last week, Atlas was one of the titans, and um, he was cursed to hold up the sky. So as you can imagine, the sky would be really heavy. So he was basically forced to stand up on this mountain and hold the sky up on his back and hands and shoulders and stuff. So that was his curse, and he had to do that forever. As you can imagine, it was not very comfortable. No. Okay. In their distress, the unfortunate... Oh, wait. I skipped a paragraph. Perseus then re resumed his travels. His winged sandals carried him over deserts and mountains until he arrived at Ethiopia, the kingdom of King Cepheus. Here he found the country filled with disastrous floods, towns, and villages destroyed, and everywhere signs of devastation and ruin. On a projecting cliff close to the shore, he noticed a lovely maiden chained to a rock. This was Andromeda, the king's daughter. Her mother, Cassiopeia, having boasted that her beauty surpassed that of Nereides, caused the angry sea nymphs to appeal to Poseidon to retaliate. And thus the sea god devastated the country with terrible waves, which he which brought with it a huge monster that consumed all that came his way. In their distress, the unfortunate Ethiopians begged the oracle of Zeus, Ammon, in the Libyan desert, and received the response that only by the sacrifice of the king's daughter to the monster could the country and people be saved. Cepheus, who fondly loved his dear daughter Andromeda, at first refused to listen to this dreadful proposal, but overcame at length by the prayers and begging of his unhappy citizens, the heartbroken father gave up his child to the welfare of his country. Andromeda was then chained to a rock on the seashore to serve as prey to the monster, where her unhappy parents watched her sad fate on the beach below. Now, I personally would rather move to a new country than sacrifice my daughter. So, I mean, not that I have a daughter, but you know what I mean. Okay. On being informed of the meaning of this tragic scene, Perseus proposed to Cepheus to kill the monster on condition that the lovely victim should become his bride. Overjoyed at the possibility of Andromeda's release, the king gladly accepted, and Perseus raced to the rock to breathe the words of hope and comfort to the frightened girl. Then, putting on once more the helmet of Hades, he jumped into the air and waited for the approach of the monster. The sea opened, and the shark's head of the gigantic beast raised itself upon the victims. Lashing his tail furiously from side to side, he leapt forward to bite his victim, but the courageous hero, watching his opportunity, suddenly darted down and, bringing out the head of Medusa from the bag, held it before the eyes of the dragon, whose hideous body became gradually transformed into a huge black rock. Perseus then unchained Andromeda and led her to, now, to her now happy parents who, anxious to show their gratitude, ordered immediate preparations to be made for the marriage feast. Perseus then left the Ethiopian king and accompanied, and 
accompanied by his beautiful bride, returned to Seraphis, where Perseus returned to give King Polydectes the gift he requested. When he did not find his mother in his court, and Polydectes would not reveal where she was, Perseus pulled out Medusa's head of the bag. Polydectes revealed that he locked her in the dungeon just before his mouth and whole head turned to stone. After he rescued his mother, he then sent a messenger to his grandfather, informing him that he intended to return to Argos. But Acreus, fearing the fulfillment of the oracle's prophecy, fled for protection to his friend, Tudimos, king of Larissa. Anxious to return to Argos, Perseus followed him. But here, a strange accident occurred. While taking part in some funeral games to celebrated in honor, in honor of the king's father, Perseus, by an unfortunate throw of a discus, accidentally struck his grandfather, and thereby, thereby was the innocent cause of his death. After celebrating the funeral rites of Acreus, Perseus presented the head of Medusa to his divine protector, Athena, who placed it on the center of her shield. Later on, as happens to demigods, when Perseus' mortal half died, he was taken up to the heavens and became a constellation, and afterwards, Andromeda was also taken to the sky to shine near his stars along with their mother, Cassiopeia. So, as that last paragraph said, if you ever see a picture of, like, um, Athena's shield, it'll have Medusa's head on it with, like, the snakes. They usually show, like, eight snake heads or something yeah. like that on there. So, um, yeah, that's pretty, pretty interesting. So, um, yeah, it's interesting to me that, like, the, the Greeks believed in all of this um, because... I don't know. A lot of it's pretty intense. It is. Yeah. Um, so. One thing I know, um, if you are a visual person, you know, you can always Google and look up these things. Mm -hmm. um, there is a movie. Um, it's called Clash of the Titans. It is rated PG-13, but it is on Perseus versus Medusa and the um, cities that were named in this Greek story. Um, it is pretty good. Um just, you know, parents, check it out. Um, if it's too violent, then, you know, obviously don't let your kids watch it. But um, it's actually pretty good, and it's a good adaptation of things. Obviously, it's Hollywood, so things are a little bit skewed in some ways, but most of it's pretty accurate and stay on. So it's called Clash of the Titans, and it is rated PG-13. So I have not seen that. I'll have to check it out. Um, oh, we did want to say last week, and I don't, think, I don't think we did, but if you are interested in mythology, especially Greek mythology, and you're not familiar with it, uh, there's an author, his name is Rick Riordan, mm -hmm. and he has written several um, books on Greek mythology, and he does a really good job. He also has, um, there's Roman mythology that he's done, and Egyptian, and I think he's getting ready to do like Celtic mythology, so that'll be really cool. Um, his most famous are the Greek, and the they're called like the Percy Jackson books. Um, a lot of you have probably heard of them. But they're just really good stories. They stay pretty true to the original myths, but they tell them in a different um, way. So it's basically like this kid, Percy Jackson, has to like do all these things. And it, it's a really good um, story. It's great for learning about Greek mythology, but it's clean. It's not real violent or anything. But... Um, so, like, this is the second book we have of the series. I think the first one's out, but these have been really popular with the kids. Mm -hmm. And you guys, um, we always have one or two out at a time. Yes, they don't stay on the shelves long. No. And there's, like, you know, there's actual the movie based off of the books, too. So, if you're more of a visual person, there is Percy Jackson, um, a couple of the different movies Rick Warden has yeah. done. And I heard um, that they were going to do a Netflix series. I think it's Netflix, or maybe it's Disney Plus. I'm pretty sure Netflix, though. So it's going to do a series redoing the movies. Um, I personally haven't seen the movies, but I've heard good things and bad things about them. So They're good, but as you, know, as you have it, you know, books to movies, movies to books, um, there's always some things that are different. They have to change for time frames, but they're pretty, pretty close hmm. with the books. Okay, so um, before I forget, I wanted to give you guys the code word for this week. So uh, once again, our summer reading program's theme is Imagine Your Story. So it's all about like fables and folk tales and mythology, fairy tales, all that stuff. Um, so if you go, if you come in and register to for our summer reading program, you can do that here at the library. 
Um, we are open now, not quite back to our full hours, but um, you can always call if you don't know what the hours are. Um, but once you register, there's a website or an app. It's called Read Squared, and you can go and um, make an account. And it's just where you can keep track of your reading and which programs you do and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, so if you need the code word for today, it is Medusa. So we learned a lot about Medusa and Athena today. We had lots of lots of stories about them. But um, I I don't know. Is there anything else you think we need to add? No, but if you do your craft, we still have some on the porch. They are available for pickup. Okay. And on our little red cart, we've got out there for materials. Um, they are in a purple bag, a big purple bag. Um, they have the terracotta pots on them. And then it has the instructions like I showed you in there. Um, you can use, I just use a Sharpie. You can use magic marker. You can use paint, whatever you have in hand. You can even use Mod Podge glitter, paper, whatever whatever you feel like doing. Um, and if you do one, be sure to um, take a picture of it, tag us in it, and that'd be really cool to see. So enjoy. Yeah, uh, and next week we're gonna start on um, Egyptian. Egyptian mythology. So that'll be interesting. I will definitely be learning a lot about that. I'm most familiar with Greek mythology. So we will see you guys next week. We hope you enjoyed. Bye guys.